Thank you all for joining us today. It's great to look out there and see all these uh, familiar, friendly, and helpful faces that have really helped us uh, to get where we are today. Um, I'm going to, just in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to um, try to frame the afternoon a bit and try to frame a little bit about, uh, uh, give a little sense of where we are, where I think we are in terms of, of the CTSI. Um, so this is a tale of summer, I think, uh, well, you'll see why on the slide number one. So I've just come back from a uh, uh, summer vacation. I grew up in Colorado and um, uh, went back um, to see my folks and brought my kids with me. And um, uh, we had a great trip. Um, and my, my folks belong to the, as probably many of grandparent age do, belong to the Historical Society of Colorado. And so they decided we should ride this historical train that connects uh, Georgetown to Silver Plume, Colorado. And Talmadge, you, you know this train. Um, and I had done it as an adolescent and thought it was horribly boring. Um, but um, now that I'm a little older, I actually really enjoyed the trip. And our, our kids, who are eight and six, also really love the trip. So you can see there's a, you know, their age appropriateness for trips like this. Um, and my son asked this question, Daddy, why does the, why does the train stop here? And I'm going to um, use this to talk a little bit about where we are now. Um, so this train, this is a train um, it, that connects the two. And it goes over this gigantic bridge to do a loop in order to get down this, this big incline. Um, and it got me interested in, you know, well, what is this train doing here? And what really is the history of the train? This actually, I do think, is a nice metaphor for where, where we are, what our job is in, in CTSI. And so now I'm just going to take you very quickly and in a sort of a not very educated way through um, an evolution of an industry, in this, in this case the, the railroad industry. Um, in the railroad industry definitely started just as we did in CTSI with a startup and a build phase um, during which they had to bring people on to get the job done build the basic structures to get things moving. Um, they started slow, but they were able to accelerate. And for them, a lot of this was driven by, um, by the migration. And the migration was initially largely driven by mining. So mining, like the basic discoveries of, uh, of our day, the basic science discoveries, mining was their um, basic discovery. And they needed infrastructure in order to support um, the discovery of, of uh, minerals and then the mining of it. So this in 1857 is what uh, the Western states look like. You forget um, just how bizarre things were, how undefined things were back then. But look at California. We were actually smaller, but then one of our boundaries hadn't even been defined because Arizona wasn't there yet. Um, Nevada was this weird sort of squarish looking thing. I mean, it was totally different. This is also showing, and it's hard to see, a few railroad lines. Um, there's some smudges on here for proposed new railroad lines, but there were very few railroad lines in 1857. And then, so how, how did this come about? Well, it ends up that there was an investment here. So for them, it, the, the investment was out, almost all outside the U.S. Um, it was only later that U.S. Um, uh, uh, train, you know, ind industrialists got, got in the mix. It was mostly venture capital equivalents from, from Europe that invested in the mines and in the trains. For us, of course, that it's been NIH largely, and we're fortunate to have our uh, several folks from NIH, including um, our program officer, uh, Rosemary, Rosemary uh, Feilert, who's here somewhere. Um, yeah, so thank you. But we also are fortunate to have our other investors here, too, which are really the, the institutional leaders. So we've had a tremendous amount of investment from the chancellor's office, and thanks, Jeff, for coming, and also from all of the, of the, uh, the dean's offices. We've also had investment from our partners, and we've got um, partners here that are, are well represented. Um, and, uh, and recently, we've had investment more and more from industry and other partners. So the next thing that you need in order to get things started is the, 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 the people to get the job done. Um, it, you know, this is just a, a picture of a, a group that had um, just completed a, um, a, a new rail line. And uh, you know, wonderful that they took the picture of absolutely everybody in the team here. 
Um, if we, we could try to take a picture of this group today, I guess it wouldn't, I don't think it'd come out as good as this one, though. Um, and, um, you know, for us, this has been a lot of work, you know, getting the right team together. But I think we've really been able to do that um, successfully, particularly in the last few years. We had uh, great work from the, the founding team um, who really got us to where we are. And then over the last couple years, we've had some nice transitions to, um, I think, a more, um, a more permanent team um, who, uh, uh, in that, let me just quickly say, in this, in this last year, that includes Sally Mead, who's come on as uh, director of our administration. Yeah. And Lin Linda Jacobson, who's uh, the executive director for, the, for CRS. June Lee, who's come on to, uh, to lead early translational research. You'll hear more from her later today. And then Minnie Kalin has stepped up into a new role as the Deputy Director for CTSI. And we've had many, many others join, um, but I, you know, obviously can't, I'm not going to be able to mention everybody today. And then Paul Wolverding has joined our board as well, so that's a nice addition too. So those are the, the, the workforce, and of course we've got to develop new workforce too, the new miners, the new um, engineers. Um, infrastructure is another key thing of, of, that we've been trying to build, and I, I love this picture because, boy, does that, does that bridge look unsafe. Um, and I would say that some of our infrastructure feels as unsafe, unsafe and unstable as, as uh, this railroad bridge. Um, but yet, is, has been really important to accelerating the, the pace of the work that's done around here. Um, so I, uh, um, you know, over time, you, you, you know, want to build this up. But this, you know, this infrastructure includes things like clinical research services with all the centers that we have there, um, the consultation service. Um, even our small grants program could be considered uh, falling into this. So by 1870, this was the, uh, the network of, of train routes um, in the U.S. And this was very rapidly increasing over time. Um, and you can see, particularly in the, in the Pacific states and the western states, that these are total railroad miles, the rapid, rapid increase in the uh, late 1800s. And this is a picture of, of uh, that train that I showed you before on the bridge that I rode with my my two boys. Um, and it, it's a totally different place now. Um, they chopped down every single tree in this whole valley. This is now, you know, it has these big tall pine trees, um, spruce trees everywhere. Um, there's no real, there's only dirt roads in here um, at this point. Now the highway actually runs through here. I-70 runs through here. Um, so it looks totally different. And this was actually an incredibly successful mining area. Um, over 15 billion dollars, today's dollars, were pulled out. So this is like, this is a huge investment by these uh, European investors. You needed a train to haul the people, to haul the ore back and forth. And this is the, this is the peak of, of railroads in the U.S., 1918. And you can see now that network I showed you before, it's, you, you can make out the old lines if you compare them side by side, but wow, there were a lot of trains. A lot of trains going everywhere, taking people everywhere. And of course, 1918, this is right at the point at which automobiles were, were uh, becoming popular. During that time, there's a great evolution in the, in the trains as well, from you know, very early trains to much more rapid trains. And for us, you know, the, the small grants help us to do that. Um, global Health and what it does helps to do that. Um, also, our partnerships um, with other institutions on campus like IRBs and, and contracting office and all of that helps to do that, too. Okay, so now I'm moving on to, to reality. Two minutes left. Um, we're going to keep everybody on time, so me especially. Um, so on to reality. So um, I'm going to show you just really quickly some achievements that won't show up in anybody else's presentations, but just... These are broad and related to sort of where we are, how we're in our summer now. Um, so industry-sponsored clinical trials, this is thanks to Jim Kyriakis is in office. Um, those have increased over time, and we've seen a rapid um, decrease in the amount of time it takes to execute these agreements. 
And this actually underrepresents how how much change there's been because a lot of that change occurred even earlier and it may have begun at this retreat uh, three years ago when there was a big outcry that this was an, a major problem and that needed to be dealt with. IRB approval times, and this is, these are data from John Heldon's group, went from 139 days in 2009 to 71 days in, in uh, 2010. So, I mean, that's huge. For CTSI broadly, yeah, these are, these are big, big deals. For CTSI broadly, we, you know, we've seen a, a much larger number of investigators using our services. We've also seen a rapid increase in the number of publications. Uh, we don't have this year's data yet to show you. And then K grants on campus, including the ones we sponsor, but also the other ones that we've helped people to get through our training programs and other support mechanisms and mentoring, have doubled to since 2006. So really, pretty dramatic change. And we've also become financially more responsible. So this is a, an increase in our recharge revenue, which has continued to increase and must continue to increase um, further as we go forward. And, you know, we can't completely take credit for this, of course. But it's nice to see that UCSF is, um, is consolidating its position in it, number two for, for NIH funding and closing in on number one, which is Hopkins. Um, and we hope this will continue. It looks like most of this is related to, um, uh, to clinic, more on the clinical and translational end of, of, of funding than the basic. Um, but uh, but we'll, again, this it only goes through 2009. So I haven't addressed a question you know, that, that I was asked. Daddy, why does the train stop here? Well, it ends up the train stops in a dusty parking lot. It's not even in town. It's not in any of these towns. It just stops. Um, and so the question was, why would the train stop there? Well, this was 1918, and this is 2006. So the train system has really been dismantled. Um, it, we all know this, of course. And I think this, this is an important lesson for us, too, that we need to be thinking about how things are going to change in the future. Yeah, it's great. We've built this wonderful infrastructure. We've, we've really come a long way in five years. But things are going to change. We need to have our eyes open to what's around the corner. Um, and I think there are some warning signs there. Today especially, one might feel uncertainty about the future, um, particularly financially, and that really can impact us. And so we need to think about a sustainable uh, plan for the future. Now, of course, with the dismantling of trains, um, the interstate system uh, came about, and that has its own advantages and disadvantages, as we know. But also, there is a return to trains. And in fact, in that very valley that I showed you, there's a, they're considering reopening a train route, not for miners anymore, but for skiers and mountain climbers and all of that to connect Denver to, to the mountains because the auto traffic has gotten so bad. So in evolution of an industry, there's a building phase. It's, an, it's a kind of a crazy, hectic phase. You put the infrastructure in place, you've got to hire the people. And then there's a sustainability phase. That's where we are now. We've got to prepare for change, keep our eyes in the future. We've got to consider more flexible approaches that can change over time and also are flexible and responsive to the needs of our, of our users, right? And that's a lot of what we're doing now is to become more responsive, force us all, encourage us all to be more responsive to the needs of our users. And we have to continue to innovate or we will go the way of the, of the, of the rails. Okay, so with that, um, we've got a great afternoon. It's really about celebration. Last time we did this a year ago, we had to focus on what's going what's to be in our renewal. We know that now, and fortunately we have our renewal. Um, and we were really lucky to... <laughs> yeah, thanks to all your hard, hard work. And we were really lucky to, um, to not have a, a, any significant cut in our budget, which is, is quite unusual for, for, our, uh, for other CTSAs. Um, so we want to celebrate that for a bit. And that's what the CTS Idol is all about. It's a way to get in, a, in uh, allow all the programs to present their, their shining uh, moments and um, to put those in the context of what's going on in the university with our judges. Um, uh, in a short period of time. Um, and then you can, you can see the other things that we have in store for you this afternoon. 
So with that, I'm going to invite up the, uh, the judges uh, to, to the front, and we're going to launch in our experiment. So the judges um, today, and I, I can't tell you who's Paula and um, who's Simon. Um, yeah, maybe. Um, but with that, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that pans out. Um, but uh, the judges are, are Sam Hoggood, who's the uh, Dean of the School of Medicine, Talmadge King, who's the uh, uh, Chair of Department of Medicine, in, uh, and David uh, uh, Vlahoff. So thank you all for, as a Dean of the School of Nursing, thank you for doing this. And I get to be the Ryan Seacrest um, uh, of the evening. And we do, because we have so many of these presentations to do, we're going to pretty, be pretty strict about keeping to the time. So they have about, uh, except for two programs, they have five minutes to present, and then we'll have about five minutes to discuss. We may have a time for one question or one comment from the audience for each one, but we'll have to sort of see how that goes. So with that, I will invite up the uh, first group.